Hello and welcome to the Digital Diplomacy Classroom. I'm Lauren Fisher with the National Museum of American Diplomacy, and I'm so glad that you're joining us today. I'm very ex excited about today's program because we are co-hosting it with the Museum of the American Revolution. So we're, we're in for a wonderful treat today. Before I get started, I want to invite you all to follow us on our social media platforms. So if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, you'll see that there are our social media icons, as well as a way for you to sign up on our email list. We would love to stay in touch with you and share future virtual programmings that are upcoming. So join us, we'd love to hear from you. The mission of the National Museum of American Diplomacy, or NAMAD, is to share the stories of American diplomacy through artifact, exhibits, and programs. And I encourage you all to further explore our website, which you are all on, diplomacy.state.gov, to view our online exhibits and our artifact stories. Although we have exhibits both in the museum and online, NAMAD's curatorial team is currently developing content for the permanent exhibits, which we will debut when the museum fully opens. As we develop this content, it's very important that we test drive our ideas to ensure that the stories we are interested in exhibiting are compelling and interesting and that we've selected the right objects to complement what we want to share. So we would love you to be a part of this process. The stories that we're going to explore today, we hope to include in the permanent museum, and we want to hear from you. So as you hear the stories, we want to make sure that they fulfill the requirements of being provocative and interesting and informative. So make sure that you share your thoughts and your questions in the box below. Also, later in the program, we'll, we will be addressing those questions. So keep us in, you know, keep us in touch with you. Let us know what you think as we go through our program today. In addition to the museum's goal of sharing um, the practice of diplomacy, it's also NAMAD's mission to share the history of the State Department, which as the first federal agency is integral to the history of the United States. Because the State Department's mission is to conduct foreign relations on behalf of the American people, studying the history of the State Department is also exploring the history of US foreign affairs. So as we prepare to celebrate the 4th of July, which commemorates the American colonists declaring their independence from the British Empire, we thought it fitting to host a program that explored this time period when actually the State Department had yet to exist, but when international affairs and international relations were crucial to the, to the success of establishing a new nation because Benjamin Franklin conducted diplomacy and built a relationship with France. He secured an alliance between a declared independent country and a European power. This relationship enabled the colonial troops to defeat the British, thereby winning independence. Foreign relations was at the heart of our nation's beginning. But today's discussion is about the declaration heard round the world when the words of independence was written and read aloud. But what exactly did these words declare? And for whom was it declaring? How did these words impact other nations? How did it influence the future of international affairs or the affairs among nations? Luckily, to help answer these questions, I've invited two special guests uh, to join me today, my friend and colleague, NAMAD's public historian, Dr. Allison Mann, and the president and CEO of the Museum of the American Revolution, Dr. Scott Stevenson. So I would like to, invo uh, to invite uh, both Scott and Allison to the screen. Hi, Allison. We got Scott there. Mute. Everybody's unmuted, and I can see... Scott, we're waiting for Scott. He's he's in the he's hiding in the he's in the Zoom zone. He's in the Zoom zone. Yep. I hear you, Scott. I need the host to unmask my beautiful. Okay, so I have a host out there in the Zoom Great. zone as well. Um, all right. <laughs> It's so great to see you guys. Thank you both for joining us today. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. And Scott, you know, Allison, if I may say, has been working diligently on exploring different elements 
of history, U.S. foreign policy and history to include in our permanent exhibits. And I know some of the stories that we're going to share today, we're eager to put into the um, into the the permanent museum. And we want to hear from our listeners today. We want them to populate our comment box with their thoughts. So thank you for helping us out. We really appreciate it. Um, and I know once Scott, you have some slides you'd like to share, and also Allison. And at the conclusion of your presentations, we'll we'll take some questions from the audience. So excellent. So, um, you know, it's the 4th of July, it's around the corner. So independence is on everyone's, you know, everyone's mind, but salt, but also is this idea of personal freedom and equality. Um, so it seems fitting to address the source document, the US Declaration of Independence. And at the top, I sort of posed a couple questions, Scott. What did the Declaration of Independence declare and for whom? So I thought if you could kick us off and, oh, I actually have some screens I can share to, to get us thinking about that. Yeah, I know we're gonna share um, just a few images of the, our core exhibition at the Museum of Great. the American Revolution. And there we are. I'm gonna just put it into present mode one second here. Perfect. Voila, there we go. Yeah, so the Museum of the American Revolution, we're actually um, uh, a relatively young institution. We've just been open to the public for three years. We were um, on track to welcome our 1 millionth visitor since opening in April, 2017 probably during the month of June actually, but of course due to the, to the pandemic, we've been, we've been closed uh, for a few months now and we're now uh, you know, looking toward reopening hopefully later in the summer. But fortunately we had already begun work last year on a very robust virtual museum experience. And so what you're seeing is actually a screenshot from that virtual museum. Uh, that's all available for free anywhere in the world, 24 hours a day with a Wi-Fi connection at amrevmuseum.org. And you'll, you'll see right on the landing page, um, uh, a link to our virtual museum. And as you can see with the icons, you can click into all of the content. You could look at close-ups of all of the images of objects. You can read labels. You can hear an audio tour that I narrated uh, of your journey through 16,000 square feet of core exhibition. and. The, the, the chronological period that the museum covers is roughly the end of the French and Indian War, so the 1760s through to the period of the early Republic, but with the declaration kind of being the, 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 the emotional and intellectual heart of, of the story that we tell at the museum. Um, we frame our galleries around four big questions. How did people become revolutionaries? How did the revolution survive its darkest hour? How revolutionary was the war and what kind of nation did the revolution create? And so that first question, that's really our focus today. And this was something that was on the minds of mm -hmm. all kinds of Americans this week in 1776 was how people become revolutionaries and what did, that revolution mean? Who did it apply to? So as you can see, this is a, a shot in, in our gallery where we explore um, how the Declaration of Independence came about, what the document actually was, and who it applied to at, at the period. Um, uh, and I wonder what that next shot might show us a little bit of a close up here. Um, I think, uh, yeah, just a straight on shot of the center of that, um, that gallery. So when visitors come to this point in the museum, you know, they've been on a journey from celebrating the young King George III upon his coronation in 1761 as a, as a you know, representing uh, the greatest expression of human liberty in the minds, of course, of, of, uh, of uh, many British people. And then, you know, basically 15 years later, um, tearing down a statue of that same monarch. Um, actually a moment that couldn't be of more, more relevance to our public discussions uh, today. And this of course is that moment in 1776 when Americans throughout those 13 rebelling colonies go from essentially asserting, trying to assert their rights to traditional English liberties to deciding it was time to create an independent nation and giving 
an expression of what the what the values, what the what the core assumptions and principles behind the creation of that new nation would be. So, because of course we're talking about diplomacy today, it's it's important to reflect on the fact that what the declaration was. This was not a charter for creating a new government. Uh, in fact, Congress, you know, this week in 1776 is both um, debating and deciding on whether this was the moment and whether it was appropriate to declare independence. And at the same time, what would, what would the form of government that would replace monarchy and replace membership in the British Empire be? And of course, that would lead to the Articles of Confederation. Mm -hmm. But the Declaration of Independence was first and foremost a diplomatic document. It was a statement to the world that explained on July 4th of 1776 an action that the Continental Congress had taken two days earlier, July 2nd of 1776, which, which was to actually declare independence. So this was an explanation of that action um, with a preamble that includes that those powerful mm -hmm. words like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and inalienable rights and then a kind of indictment of King George III, in other words, explaining the reason for uh, this break and then asserting the right of the governed to, uh, to have a government that reflected their, their will. And I think if you uh, go to that next image, you'll see a little bit of a close up. This was, um, this was shot uh, the first summer that we were open in 2017. So we rotate printings of the Declaration of Independence at this space in the museum. Um, of course, we all know, and many of us have probably lined up at the National Archives to see the engrossed copy, the so-called parchment copy of the Declaration with those um, signatures uh, foremost, among which is John Hancock's uh, dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, signature. But of course, the way most people, not just in America, but around the world encountered the text of the Declaration of Independence was through these early printings. So here you're seeing side by side two broadside printings. And these, of course, were larger than a newspaper of the period. They were meant to be tacked up in public places or read aloud. Uh, the copy on the right, I believe, published in Boston or Salem, Massachusetts, uh, late summer of 1776. And most remarkably in the center, and if you're having a little difficulty making out the words, it's because it is not English that you're reading. It's an old script, German, and it is one of only two surviving wow. known printings of the Declaration of Independence, probably printed just a few days after July 4th in Philadelphia, printed um, just on Market Street, not far from where I'm sitting here at, right. uh, at the Museum of the American Revolution in German. And it's a great reminder. This was not printed in German to send overseas. This was because a large portion of the population of Philadelphia and the surrounding Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, of course, were, were German speakers. And it's a great reminder that America has been a polyglot nation since the very, uh, very beginning. And we're very privileged to have this example on loan to us from Gettysburg College out in Pennsylvania, where it's part of a uh, German language imprint collection at the, at the college archives. And was actually not even known, it was in a box of un, uncatalogued material, uh, I believe till the 1980s, it was actually discovered and recognized for what it is. And so a, a remarkable treasure and it's just incredible to stand in the presence mm. uh, of an object like this. Um, so we also, and actually if you could go back a slide, Lauren, sure. I just wanted to, um, if you'll see on the right side of this image, uh, the promise of equality on the wall and images of, um, of Abigail Adams, of Elizabeth Freeman, and um, uh, 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 a uh, you know, common laboring man uh, of, the, of the period. And the, the point we try to make in this gallery is to kind of confront the Declaration of Independence with this question of who did this apply to at the time. Um, laboring men, you know, again, traditionally disenfranchised, did not have political rights, but in many ways, were the first beneficiaries mm -hmm. of this, uh, uh, the, the independent republic that was created by the Declaration of Independence. Elizabeth Freeman, known in bondage as Mum Bet, who mm -hmm. sued for her, um, for her <clears throat> freedom in Massachusetts under the, 
1780 Constitution of Massachusetts and has effectively through legal action ended the institution of slavery in Massachusetts. And of course, Abigail Adams, whose famous letter to John Adams, Remember the Ladies, as written in March of 1776, anticipating mm -hmm. declaration and saying that in this new code of laws that it'll be necessary to write that uh, was hopeful that John and these other political leaders would not be so cruel and tyrannical as their forebears had been. Uh, remarkably, that letter, which has survived in the Adams papers, it's at the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston, will be at the museum for an exhibition uh, called When Women Lost the Vote, a revolutionary story that'll be opening this oh. fall um, at the museum. So again, um, it, it's important to reflect on that universal statement of <clears throat> rights that's in the second paragraph of the Declaration uh, that all men are created okay. equal. And then who did that appeal to? Uh, who did that apply to in the period? And note how quickly those who maybe were not originally thought to be all within that immediately claimed their place um, under that umbrella of, of natural rights. Now, there's one group that we haven't talked about yet. <laughs> uh, and you know, most, most significantly affected by the creation of an independent um, Republic of the United States. And those were the inhabitants, the original inhabitants of North America, Native Americans. And this is a dramatic shot of a very experiential theater in the museum uh, about the Oneida Indian nation, one of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy, the people of the Longhouse. And you see over those figures with those human figures, you see, the names of those nations, the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Tuscarora, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Seneca nations. Now, this was one of the oldest democracies in North America. It predates uh, Columbus's voyages. This was a, a confederation of nations who gathered together, uh, had previously been warring with one another, who established uh, a means of working peacefully with one another and through that alliance, we're able to chart basically 250 years of contact with European powers up until this point, 1776 mm -hmm. that we're talking about and maintain a great deal of their strength and their, their territorial integrity through those principles. They were certainly um, admired by many, including Benjamin Franklin, who, who famously said that if this group of people, it, original inhabitants who were considered to be so much uh, less advanced in terms of their civilization. This is the perspective of Europeans at the time and, and, and colonials. Um, if they were able to band together, certainly the United States, so these fledgling uh, colonies, fledgling states should be able uh, to do um, such a thing. Now, the Declaration of Independence and the creation of this new republic posed a real challenge to native people like the Iroquois Confederacy, the Oneida people, because um, this was a rigorously expansionist group of people who were forming this nation, who, uh, who uh, although the British certainly had been very willing through centuries to appropriate native land, to create new colonies, et cetera, these, uh, these neighboring American colonists for most native people were seen as the sort of greater of two evils. Um, but it, it, depending upon the circumstances of these different nations who found themselves living in the midst of an Anglo-American civil war, uh, which is an unenviable position anywhere in the world through all time to be in. And if we cast our minds, we have a viewer list today who think a lot about diplomacy in the modern world and think about different regions of the world, Syria, for instance, where you have people who uh, have to make a decision. They're being told you can't be neutral. You've got to take a side in this action. And after the Declaration of Independence, both British officials and representatives of the Continental Congress came to communities like this and said, you've got to decide. You're either an ally or you're an enemy. And so we dramatize through real people uh, who are known from the period 
and their different perspectives. Should we try to be neutral? Should we side with the British? Should we side uh, with, the, with the Continental Congress? The Oneida people ultimately going against uh, the choice of many other native people chose to side with the Continental Congress. Um, and uh, you know, very tragically in the end, although they, they uh, gave blood, sweat, treasure mm -hmm. lives in, to, uh, to help to establish American independence. Uh, it's a long tragic tale of the way that they were, wow. they were treated by the yeah. Excellent. So we move along to this. This is a this is a powerful image to kind of show just the, the broad reach that the native nations had. Yeah, this is a again a, this is a, a in that same theater, a wall mural, and really just the simple point here, you won't be able to read all the text on the screen, right. of course, but it's really to make the point that whether if you were Cherokee. If you were Lenape or Delaware, if you were Wyandot, uh, you were Shawnee, you were from any of the native nations uh, in New England, uh, this, this, this position of being put in between two warring powers. Uh, there was a metaphor that a Moravian missionary used actually said that the, that the people in the Ohio country, what's now the state of Ohio, they would describe what was happening as being caught in a pair of scissors. And they, they talked about a pair of scissors looks like it's two knives that mm -hmm. coming together will destroy one another, yeah. but it only destroys that which comes between them. And so I just, it, it, it's a line that we use in the film there. And it's a beautifully captures this terrible situation that all of these data people individually had to face and took, you know, tried to pursue different strategies because they were trying to preserve their independence and sovereignty at the same time a new nation was trying to create and establish its own independence. So it's again, one of the, one of the complications of, uh, of history that um, you know, we should all be mindful of at all times. So interesting, yeah. I actually, here's this last image here. Do you wanna say anything about this? Sure, just, you know, again, just a shot from, from the virtual, uh, from the virtual museum. And, uh, you know, I'd encourage anybody to go and just e explore. We've actually, if you go to the website, you'll see this week for 4th of July, uh, we have some scavenger hunts. So if you have some younger people in your household, grandchildren or children, they can kind of go through and it's very video game like in a sense of exploring your way uh, through this history and we hope prompting people uh to to want to return and, and see the museum you know once we're back up and running and I'm, I'm sure they will but thank you so much for that very interesting i don't think we think of the declaration of independence as being a, a document about diplomacy or of diplomacy and we don't we, we want to celebrate it right for you know certainly now but we don't think about its impact that it had on the native nations at the time that it was read. Um, and we don't think about how um, it impacted those native nations where they needed to kind of take sides, if you will. So thank you so much for sharing that. And now I'd like to turn to my colleague and friend, Dr. Mann. I know you're gonna be, you've been thinking a lot about the global impact that the declaration had around the world, which we don't often think about either. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. So Scott, yeah, excellent. You know, so, such a fascinating, um, you know, history. And I, I love the way that you set that gallery up. And in our museum, we certainly do want to tell this story. A lot of people think about um, Native Americans in a very domestic context. Um, we want to shift that, you know, we want them to think about that these are Native nations and to think about these native nations in an international context, because these native nations, as you, you know, discuss Scott, had these alliances with European powers, you know, stretching back, you know, 200 years previous to the Declaration of Independence. And what do those alliances mean? You know, if the United States declares itself independent, what happens to the Native American nations who are allied with the British? Do they stay with the British? You know, they really have to think about this and what is in their own best interests. And that really is at the heart of diplomacy when we build alliances and, you know, everyone comes to the table with a different stake. And of course, you know, number one is protecting your own sovereignty. So I'm going to spend a few minutes, um, you know, talking about the global Im impact of the declaration, not just in 1776, you know, but bringing it up into the present day, because that's very much how we want our audiences to experience the declaration in this international context. 
Uh, this is uh, the UN map of the world. You know, this is how kind of we, we look sort of at the globe now. And um, for the past 230 years, the Declaration of Independence has served as, as a model, you know, for, for many countries that have emerged from empires over the past 230 years. And actually, over half of the current 193 member states in the United Nations do have their own declarations of independence. Um, many of these did draw directly from the 1776 declaration in terms of its structure. Um, I love how you, you sort of set that up, Scott, in your talk when you showed the gallery, because there's a definitive structure, right? There's the, the preamble and very large words, which we hope when they were reading them, they were shouting out these words, you know, hear ye, hear ye proclamation, declaration. Um, so, but a lot of the, the declarations of independence over the past 230 years, you know, some of the language was directly taken. Some of it followed the exact same structure. Um, and then, uh, but, but really the intent, right, was out there for an audience. It was for an international audience to make this declaration that we, the people of this particular region are now free and independent. So what I wanna do in the next few minutes is just you know, do a brief exploration of some of the countries that have uh, you know, been affected by the Declaration of Independence and sort of how we hope to tell that story. Um, this map, I, I think, is interesting, you know, on so many levels. It only shows uh, the Spanish Empire and the British Empire and shows, I think, the, the great breadth of it. And if you like maps like this, it just comes from Wikipedia. You know, you could Google, like, you know, Empire of France or Empire of Belgium and you'd get, like, a same map. But I like this because it shows, like, in a really colorful, interesting way, um, the period of time, right? It shows the dates, it shows the flags of the country, Brit, um, Great Britain's on the left and Spain is on the right, you know, showing over the course of, of 200 years. So it's really fascinating. The other point too, Lauren, that I wanted to bring up is we, we talk a lot about sovereignty, like that word mm -hmm. gets bandied around a lot, mm -hmm. you know, but if you pin someone down and you said, what does that mean? They would say, well, sovereign, that's like a king, you know, not really sure. So I just wanted to um, make clear that when we talk about the Declaration of Independence and sovereignty and what that means, sovereignty means the absolute right to self-govern. Like you're taking that authority, right, to govern yourself. So when we talk about a sovereign nation, it's declaring that, that right, that sovereign right. So let's move on. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so now it's time for some audience participation. Um, I just want to throw this out there to our audience and, and you know, tap this into your, your comment box, please. Um, what year did the United States become an independent sovereign nation? What year? So I'm asking for a year. So here we have, you know, the 13 colonies in North America. It's 1776. And they all say, hooray, we're free and independent. Hurrah. Then across the Atlantic, you have a couple of different responses. Um, so what do you think the British had to say about that when they received news of the Declaration of Independence? And, and they heard of this pretty early. I think it was like early, you know, August, pretty much as fast as a ship could get across the Atlantic and, and the news hit in London. And, you know, the, the response was uh, no. <laughs> you, you were not free and independent, number one. And number two, you know, poppycock, like ridiculous, you know, you colonists belonging to the British Empire, this is the greatest empire of the world. White people in the British Empire, you know, at the time were considered to be the most free and independent people in the entire world. They thought this was stuff and nonsense. Um, and that there was absolutely no legality behind this whatsoever, you know, and you know, they were just, they were annoyed. Um, they didn't even want to send an official response to it because sometimes if you send an official response, you're acknowledging it. Like mm -hmm. that, that's how just like absurd they thought it was. Like we don't even want to acknowledge this. So the talk was really more in private circles and, uh, you know, philosophers writing about the, the illegality of it. But interesting too, let's look a little bit to the South, right? What did France and Spain have to say about this declaration? They said, huh, interesting, maybe we have to think about it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this is where diplomacy plays mm -hmm. a huge role because what makes a country free and independent? I'm sitting in the middle of New Hampshire right now. If a bunch of me and my neighbors got together and said, you know what? We are now 
the nation state of New Hampshire. I wrote my own Declaration of Independence. Here you go. What makes it so? What makes a country free and independent? Is it a military victory? Is it simply declaring it? Is it the recognition of other great powers among the earth, to quote the Declaration? Like, wh what is it? Well, I actually have a couple of responses here. Let's hear so it. your question is, at, at what year did the United States become an independent country? 1778? Aha. Uh -huh. 1776? 1783? There's a couple 1783. I'll throw in for fun, 1781. <laughs> Battle of Yorktown. Uh, what do you guys think? Well, officially it's 1776, what? right, Pat? <laughs> well, the question is, if a tree falls in the forest and uh -huh. no one hears it, does it make a sound? <laughs> so is the, is the treaty uh, with France in 1778 mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. recognition by a European power, mm -hmm. does that constitute independence? Or is it the Treaty of Paris in which King George, not without a great deal of bringing uh, <laughs> 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 about this. Yeah. Right. right, that's a great point. Is it the acquiescence of the empire that then creates the country, right? Like, what is it? And um, so later on, you know, in, in our gallery, um, our visitors can explore that 1778 treaty and what that meant. And also mm -hmm. in the context of what that meant to the Native American nations, many of whom had been allied with the French, especially during the French and Indian War. And so did that matter? When the United States became an ally of France, did that then give them leverage to approach these nations and say, hey, we've got this powerful ally, they're your ally, let's, let's be allies. So, um, yeah, that's something that we really do want to flesh out in the museum. So yeah, all, all great answers, all valid, all very, very provocative. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of these countries specifically that did, um, you know, were directly impacted. Haiti is a really fascinating example. Um, you know, it's, it's a nation, it's the first black republic um, to be created in the entire world. And, um, you know, as a result of, of this independence movement, it is sparked in the 1790s um, by free and enslaved um, black people in the French empire, you know, who rose up just very much like the colonists did, rose up militarily to fight literally for their freedom literally for their freedom. For them, it was life and death. Um, this announcement though in 1804, you know, th this is one of those post-military declarations. Um, you know, the rebellion against the French begins in the 1790s, but this declaration, mm -hmm affirmation of sovereignty comes in 1804 mm -hmm. and this is when Napoleon does acquiesce you know this is essentially the the 1783 argument right this is where the empire acquiesces that Haiti is a free and independent and sovereign nation but what's really fascinating is the language here like it doesn't so much follow um, the United States Declaration of Independence and of course it's it's in French but when they say independence or death they really mean it because for them, returning in any form to an empire would literally be death, and that would be slavery. That would be a return to slavery. So you would think that the United States would be very proud, right, mm -hmm. Lauren? Of, of yeah. the mm -hmm. One would think, but. Would think. However, rather not. Um, it is at the heart um, uh, a slave rebellion against an empire. And in uh, the state of Georgia and South Carolina, you mm -hmm. had very high enslaved population and the fear that this would be sort of like a contagion of rebellions was very much there. So during Jefferson's administration, they will refuse to formally acknowledge Haiti. And actually Haiti would not be recognized diplomatically by the United States until 1862 in the midst of the civil war. And Lincoln would issue this and said, it's right and proper that the United States should do this. And this is on, of course, you know, the prelude to the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay. Uh, let's move on, just go a little bit further south. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, but Venezuela and a lot of these countries that are created from Central and South America in this period of time from the Spanish Empire, they really do follow the structure of, of the American Declaration of Independence. There's this prelude, and then there's this uh, you know, list of, of grievances and why they're doing it, and very much um, 
in the in the in the spirit of the American Declaration of Independence. However, the big difference here, rather than um, the Caribbean nation of Haiti, is that the Americans were like, "Hooray! <laughs> this is fabulous. We support this, you know, with every fiber of our of our beings here, because they saw this as the natural spread of liberty and the creation now of republics." And they saw this as the Western hemisphere finally freeing itself. And for the United States, they saw trade partners, they saw all sorts of alliances to be created for this. And also the idea that it was a political system that was very similar you know, to the United States of America. And it would be uh, these independence movement that would last into the early 1820s that would, um, that would bring on the Monroe Doctrine, Monroe's address, you know, that, that the United States was now committed to protecting these republics um, from being um, uh, encroached upon by empires or further, you know, colonized stepping in there. So, you know, a, a bit difference. Mm -hmm. Liberia, you know, awesome example. And we, we have something from our collection that really represents this quite nicely. Uh, this is a handmade quilt that was presented to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice in 2006. And um, Liberia is, is a fascinating case. It's a, it's a free and independent country, of course, in Africa. But it was established in the 1820s, the early 1820s, as a result of the American Colonization Society. This was a, a racist organization um, that sought to take free um, African Americans and ones who had been previously enslaved and emancipated and colonize them to pay for them to go over and set up this colony in, um, in, in Western Africa. And so it had sort of been under the auspices of this American colonization society, not the US government for a number of years. And then finally in 1847, um, they got together and said that we are going to declare our own sovereignty, that we are no longer a colony anymore. We are a free and independent nation. And the Liberian Declaration of Independence is fascinating because it is almost exactly modeled on the United States Declaration of Independence. And you'd see our audience can see some of these excerpts from it, you know, um, when Jefferson, you know, lays out all the grievances, the remonstrances against uh, George III, look at those remonstrances here, um, excluded from all participation in the government. Well, that's something Americans, you know, had a grievance against. We were taxed without our consent, taxation without representation. Right. So, um, you know, a lot of this is is absolutely modeled. Mm -hmm. Liberia, too, though, uh, would not be recognized by the United States diplomatically until 1862. Um, and it is the second black republic, you know, in the world. So um, at the same time that the United States recognized Haiti, they also recognized Liberia and sent um, ministers over to both countries and established. Interesting. Those. Interesting. Uh, Vietnam, this, this is such a you know, fascinating example for so many reasons, because this is an example of a country modeling their Declaration of Independence, you know, very much in the same structure as the American Declaration of Independence, except we know that Vietnam did not become a republic, right? Mm -hmm. Vietnam becomes a communist. communist. So it's a great example showing how you can use these use liberty, right? but then you have a political system that's completely different. Mm. Um, Ho Chi Minh would stand in front of a throng of thousands. This is right after World War II ended um, in 1945. And he began it by saying, all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There you go. So, you know, for the Vietnamese people, they turned to the model of liberty and freedom that came from 1776 to declare their own independence from the French Empire. And Ho Chi Minh and the, Vietnam, the Vietnamese people, you know, they also too listed this uh, remonstrances against that, you know, deprived our people of democratic liberty, forced us to use opium and alcohol, again, the taxation without representation. But it, that, that sentence that I, I took there from the end, I think is, is fascinating because this is Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese people looking at the allied nations and looking at the language that's coming out of World War II, the self-determination language, um, the language that's being used as they met in San Francisco and Tehran to talk about the formation of the United Nations. 
And so, you know, here's Ho Chi Minh kind of throwing back the words on the Americans saying, you, you declared your sovereignty with these words. Now the Vietnamese people are declaring their sovereignty with these words. And we know that it would be a long protracted struggle for mm -hmm. the people of Vietnam, you know, to establish mm -hmm. their nation. The mm -hmm. United States would break the diplomatic ties with Vietnam in 1975 with the evacuation um, from the embassy in Saigon, but then reestablish those relations during Clinton's administration in 1997. And now, you know, enjoys a very healthy relationship with the country of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, um, you know, we wanted to Kosovo. Kosovo is, um, is, is a really interesting modern example of like, you know, what makes a nation and when does a nation exist? And what happens when a certain portion of the world acknowledges the nation and its sovereignty and then some nations don't? Like, wh where do you sort of fit in all of that? Kosovo is, is a region, it was an autonomous region, um, within Serbia, you know, after the breakup of Yugoslavia and then the Balkans conflict in the 1990s. And uh, in 2008, Kosovo declared its unilateral independence from Serbia, that they were a free and independent nation. This is also something, you know, that we have a piece for in our collection, which is really fascinating. This was presented in 2011 to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. It's got, you know, all those original signatures on it, which is so interesting. So it doesn't really follow, you know, the model of the American Declaration of Independence, but, you know, you could see in these excerpts that I pulled out, you know, that that it's it's a proclamation, you know, you know, this this is them saying we have formed our own government. We are governing ourselves. We are free and independent. Um, we're determined to see our status resolved. That means that they are determined that this country is supposed to be recognized. Now, Kosovo is not a member of the UN. It is not in the member states. And um, actually, less than half of the member states of the United Nations do recognize Kosovo as a free and independent nation, the United States being one of them. After Kosovo declared its independence in February of 2008, the very next day, President G.W. Bush would acknowledge um, Kosovo's right to exist, very much like Harry Truman would acknowledge the state of Israel, like, you know, just a, just a day later. And so, you know, but just because you have a powerful friend, you know, in our very complex modern world does not necessarily mean that mm. the rest of the world is going yeah. to going to agree. Yeah, so interesting. So I pose to our, our listeners out there, you know, have you thought about the American Declaration of Independence and its ripple effect like this? And which story or stories did you find most impactful? You know, certainly there's um, how it resonated with the Native Nations here um, in what is now the United States um, or any of the other countries that Allison sort of outlined for us. So really incredible. I don't think we, we think about the, our, our, our American declaration in that kind of powerful way and what it meant to the rest of the world, really. Um, so with that, um, do you think that the designers or the founders of this declaration of, of independence, did they, did, did they expect to, to, for the declaration to have that kind of resonance? And I, I pose that to both of you to kind of chime in as you, as you want. Sure. Well, I'm uh, where I'm sitting at the corner of Third and Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. If you walk two blocks west on Chestnut Street, you're at the old Pennsylvania State House Independence Hall. Um, but just a block south on Third Street from where I'm sitting was the book publisher and bookstore of Robert Bell, who in January of 1776 published uh, a pamphlet, a political pamphlet written by a recent English immigrant named Thomas Paine oh. called Thomas Common Sense. <laughs> uh, and one of those electrifying lines that helped to persuade a vast swath of the American public to embrace the independence movement was we have it in our power to begin the world mm -hmm. over again. Sometimes it was late, later was recast as we have the power to begin the world anew, um, but same sentiment. Yeah. And so, um, you know, this was a this was a group of people who did feel um, that, you know, the very word revolution, you know, which is like revolving revolution was this idea that um, societies go through evolution over time and that it, you were actually bringing 
bringing government back to first principles. Um, it was this idea that it would, that um, by, by uh, creating Republican government, by, by uh, putting power in the hands of the people, mm -hmm. it was uh, this opportunity to, to bring society back to what was believed in the political philosophy of the time to be um, sort of a more pure um, form of governance, uh, something that was much more, much more responsive to uh, the needs of the people. And so it was ap absolutely a message for the world. For the uh, world. And again, the irony being, and we talk about this, you know, in other places in the galleries and the museum, the irony being in a place like France, um, you know, the, the aristocracy uh, were, were really caught up in this in this uh, contagion of liberty and fascinated by what was going on in America. And of course, Benjamin Franklin being our consummate diplomat who remade himself into this, you know, American uh, rustic uh, character. That wasn't Benjamin Franklin in the 1760s, proud of being wealthy, prematurely <laughs> retired, a man of leisure to indulge his interests, dressed in very fine imported clothing. And here he is in the 1770s in Paris, wearing a Martin fur right. cap, you know, dressed very plain, a kind of rustic um, American. Um, but thinking about the power of those ideas for a class of people who just a few years later would be, um, you know, largely wiped away by the French Revolution yeah, right. and, the, you know, creating the French Republic. The irony, yeah. yeah. Well, the only thing I want to point out, I'll be really quick, because I don't know if we have any questions from our audience, but... You know, one of the most remarkable things about 1776 is how radical this is. And, you know, it's like, but they opened the box, you know, they opened the box of liberty. And then they would spend quite a number of years trying to tamp it down, you know, which is kind of interesting. And, you know, the French Revolution sort of shows, uh, you know, what happens when liberty goes to excess, you know, and there's certainly a lot of conversations going on in the United States about, you know, is this really an outgrowth of our revolution mm. or is this just like revolution gone mad, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and can you, can you tamp it, you know? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There is one comment from someone that said, didn't, Jefferson was hoping for this worldwide impact, yes? Mm -hmm. Sort of a, a rhetorical question there, yeah. Yes, yeah. Didn't Jefferson do an about face during the Haitian revolution, if memory serves correctly? Why do you think this was? Did he fear a similar event here? Yeah, well, so significant. One, one, well, one of the last statements, you know, Jefferson wrote during his lifetime in 1826, right before his death, was about hoping that the declaration would be, um, a, 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 you know, a lamp for, for man. Mm, yeah. yeah. The opening of the world to, uh, to um, you know, rights and equality. But ironically, at the same time, time. at this point, had moved from being someone who was, <clears throat> at least a bit equivocal about slavery at the time of the revolution to really hardening and being, you know, having a very different um, relationship to that institution by, uh, you know, 50 years after the declaration, the end, the end of his life. And of course, I think as Allison said earlier, you know, the, 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 the specter of a slave rebellion yeah. um, in, in Haiti was, um, um, was horrifying to those who were holding others in bondage and constantly living in a kind of state right. of war. Um, right. Right. But you know what also occurred to me, this isn't Jefferson centric, but you know, right before the program, I was thinking like, okay, it's, it's, it's so interesting that we're like in different places, you know, Lauren, you're, you're in Alexandria, you're just a few miles away from Mount Vernon. That's Scott, true. Uh, you're, you're in the middle of, of like, yeah, you know, which which was the capital of the United States. And I am in a little town in New Hampshire, which was the final home of Ona Judge, mm -hmm. who was uh, uh, one of President Washington's enslaved uh, persons. She had been uh, born into mm -hmm. slavery enslaved by George and Martha Washington. She was born on Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. But again, the genie of the bottle, you know, you can't just go and take a piece of paper and say all men are created equal and read that, you know, out in the public square and not expect people to take that, those words literally. And, you know, Ona Judge is, is a woman who self-emancipates herself when mm -hmm. Washington is in Philadelphia as president of the United States. Um, you know, she leaves Philadelphia, comes up to New Hampshire, 
and lives her her life out in in freedom here and you know passed away just a, a couple of miles from where i'm sitting right now so oh, we, we're all very much interconnected here mm -hmm. right so we do have a couple questions so regarding scott's presentation the german writings included so i guess the the german version of the independence included is a great fact to know that a great reminder that america is what we are today because we are a nation of immigrants who labored and fought together for these rights Question about the Declaration of Independence. I read somewhere that Congress adopted John Adams' Declaration of Life, Liberty, and Property, but it seems that was changed in the final version. Is that true and why was it changed? Yeah, so um, this is, I think there's the popular vision of the Declaration mm -hmm. of Independence as Thomas Jefferson sort of climbs up the mountain <laughs> and <laughs> with the equivalent of the, the Ten Commandments. Um, uh, it's important to remember this was, uh, Jefferson himself would say, you know, this was an expression of the American mind, uh, claimed that there was nothing particularly novel or new in it, that he was trying to capture, um, you know, a, a sentiment widely shared. I think he was certainly later in life as he included it as one of the things he wanted to inscribe on his tombstone. He was quite proud of authorship, but also was a bit frustrated in the period by how much editing took place, uh -huh. not just by his fellow committee right. members. And it's important to remember right. the famous John Trumbull painting that hangs in the Capitol, and there's a bronze version of it on the side of our building, actually, uh, is often called the, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, but it's actually depicting the moment in which the Committee of Five uh, that included, of course, Adams and uh, Jefferson were delivering the draft document to Congress. And then, of course, it went through an editing, uh, okay. editing process. So yes, absolutely. I mean, another example of those edits is uh, in the indictments of George III, the various things that were you know, cited as evidence for why independence was necessary. In the, in the final version, it talks about that he, meaning the king, was sending of foreign mercenaries over to, to put down you know, his subjects. It included in the original draft that Jefferson wrote, uh, Scott, uh, mentioned Scottish mercenaries. So referring to Highland Scots who were, who were being sent over, who in the period were considered to be, you know, sort of barely, uh, barely British and a somewhat mm -hmm. primitive people who were very warlike. Uh, but of course there were members of Congress like James Wilson and others who were Scottish. And so some of that was tamped, that language was tamped, tamped down. down. Interesting. Yeah. Can you imagine like, wait a second, <laughs> you know, like, hold on there. What did you say? Wait, wait, you're like, go back. You know, I can, I just, that arduous, you know, process of, of going through it, you know, sentence by, by sentence. And something that's always struck me too about, um, you know, the words that were, that made it into the final version of, of referring to these Native American nations as merciless savages, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to have to go out there and you're going to have to negotiate with these nations because you need them, you know, the United States has nothing and nobody, right? And you need them, you know, it doesn't, it, it, it's a, it's a cognitive dissonance, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like laying out those grievances and, and to them like well that. an additional comment here is the concept to have either prof property versus pursuit of happiness is a telling for diplomacy as well in order to figure out kind of your point alice and how do you figure this out you really need to use those skills of diplomacy and the practice of diplomacy to kind of kind of determine what your final copy is going to be um so alice and this goes back to your independence question um, and this is from a, a listener. Now I'm wondering, would it be when you asked about what year did we become independent? Now I'm wondering, would it be when we formed a stronger government? So the Constitution, so 1789. So maybe we can, you can kind of give your thoughts on that. When did we become independent? Some people say that that's what we should be celebrating. <laughs> the ratification of the Constitution is really the creation of the United States of America. Um, you know, the, the government that was set up in 1776, you know, I, I mean, it was like uh, sewed together, you know, as quickly as those flags were sewed together, this idea that you had this loose federation of states. Nowhere in the Declaration does it mention a nation. 
it's talking about states, um, you mm-hmm. know, and and the eventual that's true. That's true. right. That's absolutely right. Is, yeah. is the triumph of federalism is the triumph yeah. of a nation yeah. within these states. It, again, it it goes back to 1776 being so radical, like a mm-hmm. moment extreme mm-hmm. radicalism where the people of the United States were at their very weakest. And then, you know, the years that they spent like tamping it down, you know, the, the constitution is in a sense, a conservative reaction really in many respects to 1776. Oh. All right. I hope we have time for one more, which is we talk a lot about U.S. diplomats like Ben Franklin, but how about or how did foreign diplomats play a role in getting their countries to support the declaration and getting Native American tribes to ally themselves with the American cause? Thinking of figures like Marquis de Lafayette, et cetera. Perfect. Well, Great question to end about, on. Yeah, diplomacy yeah, so and diplomacy. Lafayette and I can talk about the, the Lenape Delawares. Sure, well, um, you know, the Oneida people as a great example had been, uh, very closely connected with the French going back to the period before the British victory in the Seven Years' War when Canada was part of New France. And so there was, um, you know, through this period, a kind of, uh, a kind of you know, cultural diplomatic connection to the French. And, um, and in 1776, 1777 in particular, as both the British and the Continental Congress were were putting the pressure on native nations who up to that point, both sides had been encouraging them to stay out of the fight. They, they described it as a kind of family quarrel and asked them not to get involved. But then once Declaration of Independence happens, everybody's doubling down, you know, the stakes are so much higher. And so Lafayette actually, uh, and other, you know, French officers were dispatched to meet with um, native people in New York, uh, up, up, you know, upstate New York, the Oneida in particular. And that was a connection uh, that, that grew to be very deep and affectionate between Lafayette and the Oneida people. There was a, a young Oneida man named Peter Otsiket who actually went back to France with uh, Lafayette, uh, received education there, came back um, and became a you know leader uh, among his people. When Lafayette returns in 1824-25 for his, his tour through the young United States um, and he's going through central New York, uh, he asks, you know, where are the Oneida people? Like this was, this was, a, this was a very important relationship that was remembered in, uh, and in fact, in a very famous painting that hangs in Versailles, a mm. copy of which is, wow. is in the museum of the Battle of Yorktown, mm-hmm. uh, showing Washington, Lafayette, Rochambeau, mm-hmm. the French mm-hmm. officers. It's the only North American image of this whole hall of battle in Versailles. There are figures representing the Oneidas in the background okay. of that painting. Interesting. Um, so, and that, that's a diplomatic relationship. Absolutely. That was, that was remembered. Um, you know, long afterwards. Wow, wonderful. Allison? The of language is so fascinating that, you know, the diplomatic language of the time was not English. Mm-hmm. It was French. Mm-hmm. You know, this is true throughout, you know, all of Western Europe for the most part and on the North American continent. So, um, you know, when these white colonists would encounter, you know, Native nations who spoke another language besides their own, it would be French. Mm-hmm. And um, just briefly, I'll bring up um, 1778, because this is something we really do want to talk about in the museum. You know, when Franklin is able to secure this alliance with the French king in early 1778, you know, Congress had sent emissaries out, um, two brothers with the last name of Lewis, to go negotiate with the Lenape Delaware tribes in Western Pennsylvania. And, you know, they came to the tribes with like kind of nothing. What, what they needed was access through um, the Delaware's lands so that they could you know, pr- okay. use their- <clears throat> and send them through. The last thing the Americans wanted was to be fighting, you know, like multiple fronts against Native nations as well as the British. And they wanted to launch an attack um, on Detroit. And so they went into these negotiations and they were able to secure a treaty. This is the first treaty. Um, the United States and a native nation in 1778, the Treaty of Fort Pitt. And, you know, one of the one of the inducements that the Lewis brothers will, through an interpreter, tell the Delaware is, well, you know what, if we're successful at this, maybe you could be a 14th state. Like they throw that out there, you know. And for the for the Delawares, you know, their understanding of this was that this was a temporary alliance. We let you go mm-hmm. through the country, mm-hmm. you know, and it would fall apart very quickly. 
So one of the really interesting juxtapositions between these two alliances is, you know, the French are one of the strongest allies of the United States to date, you know, with, with pretty much without any interruption, you know, for 200 years. And the same year in 1778, this treaty, you know, with the Lenape Delaware Nation falls apart very quickly. Mm -hmm. course, you know, it, it's not <clears throat> recognized now. Wow. Thank you both for this most interesting conversation and for us to all think about uh, the global impact and the diplomacy of the Declaration of Independence. I can't wait to see what ultimately um, goes into our permanent museum of the uh, National Museum of American Diplomacy. So everyone look for that. Let us know your thoughts on these stories shared today. Thank you so much. Now, Scott, I know this is your busy time. It's the 4th of July week. And I want to also just mention that you do, you're doing another program this evening. You have Read the Revolution speaker series. So a program starts at 6. And I believe that's on your website, right? Right. Right. Museum.org. Yep. People can register for that. Caitlin Fitz uh, is going to be talking about her book that explores the connection between the revolutionaries, uh, that revolution generation, and the Latin American revolutions oh, wow. of the early 19th century. So very relevant okay. to, to what we've been talking, talking about. To, excellent. So <laughs> wonderful. Thank you for taking the time. And I know that Allison and I will be talking about continuing this conversation with our re uh, relationship and alliance with France. Um, our next diplomacy classroom is in Ju July 14th, which looks at Bastille Day and our treaties with, um, with the French. So please join us then. And for now, I'm just going to say thank you both so much and happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of July. <laughs> okay, we'll see you later. Bye. Bye.